Welcome to Lady Teal's Curios. I'm your host, Lady Teal. On tonight's episode of Wanderings, we travel to North Georgia, where a small alpine village called Helen sits, surrounded by beautiful mountain views, with one mountain in particular standing out, Mount Yona. We've been living at the base of Mount Yona since August, and I have been wanting to cover a few of the eccentricities of this area for a while. Every time I researched the history and lore, I came across conflicting information. It was frustrating, to say the least. I continued researching the usual legends, ghosts, cryptids, and any other strange stories or paranormal activity about the area. And for a location that is clearly rich with history, the information on it is broken, changed, and disturbed by those who clearly want a different story told. We always came to Helen when we lived closer to Metro Atlanta for hiking, camping, and of course grabbing a good beer. Helen is a well-known tourist destination and becomes a hot mess of drunken Americans dressed in German garb in October for Oktoberfest. I have to admit, the charm of the cute German buildings is not lost on me, and they really do have some delicious Rubens. While Helen is super cute, and I definitely recommend stopping by for a beer and Reuben if you are driving through this part of Georgia, we're actually going to focus on the region surrounding the area known as Sati Nakuchi. On road trips from Atlanta to Helen, I remember passing by an Indian mound on the right and using it as a landmark to know I was that much closer. Now that I live here, I pass by the mound quite often. I always glance over to acknowledge its presence. Tonight, I stop for a change, to stand in front of it and take in the beauty and listen to the cows nearby. This mound is quite famous in Georgia, you see. It's the only burial mound I've ever seen with an ornate gazebo with a red roof perched atop. Similar to a gazebo that you would see at a wedding or elopement. The mound has become famous for the legend behind it. Just like the tragic tale of Romeo and Juliet, the legend of Sati and Nakuchi claims to be well documented. I will now tell you the tale. This story comes from southernpenning.com. The first white settlers coming up the Unicoi Trail, now known as Georgia Highway 17, heard the story as they stopped to rest in the shade of the giant white oak still standing adjacent to the old Sati store. One among them, George Williams, a young lad at the time, retold this story in his memoirs. The Cherokees considered themselves to be a superior race, as indeed they were, handsome, Tall and intelligent, they even had an alphabet, the first in America. They were not nomads. They built log houses and tilled the soil. They had but one grievous fault. The superiority was allowed to show. Naturally, this did not endear them to the neighboring tribes. One of these, the Chickasaws, was constantly at war with the Cherokees. However, there were moments of relative calm. During one such truce, a band of Chickasaws was allowed to cross over Cherokee land provided they stayed on the Unicoi Trail and rested only at designated spots. One such spot was where two trails crossed at the junction of two lovely valleys, the same place where a century later, young George Williams stopped. As the Chickasaw band rested in the shade of the giant oak, 
around them gathered curious Cherokees trying to get a closer look at the despised Chickasaws. Soon they were trading insults and obscenities, the Cherokees hoping to bait the Chickasaws into making an overact. But the Chickasaws were too cagey to be trapped by such obvious maneuvers. One of the Chickasaws stands aloof from this bickering. It is Sauti, young, handsome, and a chief's son. He dreams of the day when he will be chief and has the authority to negotiate a permanent peace with the Cherokees. Something of this greatness must have shown for Nakuchi, the Cherokee chief's 16-year-old daughter, is so taken by this handsome stranger that she stares unashamedly. Then their eyes meet. The magic alchemy of love does the rest. Not one spoken word, and yet a tryst was made. That night, Nakuchi steals away from her father's log house to meet with Sati under the giant white oak now known as the Sati Oak. By this time, they are helplessly and hopelessly in love. The rest of Sati's party counsels against this madness. No good could possibly come of this flagrant violation of their truce. If Wahu, the girl's father, learned of this meeting, all would be doomed. But then, as now, teenagers feel they must defy the establishment. Run if you must, Sati tells his followers, but I remain here with Nakuchi. Together we will make Wahu understand. This must be the first step to a lasting peace between our two nations. The young lovers then flee to nearby Yona Mountain. There, in a secret cave known only to Nakuchi, they spend a few idyllic days. They have their love, they have each other. But destiny calls to a larger purpose, peace between two great tribes. To this end, out they come to face Wahoo. With such a just and lofty purpose, how could they not succeed? Wahoo is a great chief and has wisdom to handle all problems, but this time, when compassion and understanding are most needed, he is blinded by hate and Wahoo is a great chief and has wisdom to handle all problems, but this time, when compassion and understanding are most needed, he is blinded by hate and chagrin that his beloved Nakuchi would choose a Chickasaw to himself. He ordered Sati thrown from the high cliffs of Yona Mountain while Nakuchi is forced to look on. Life without her Sati holds no promise. Nakuchi tears away from the restraining hands of her father and she too leaps from the high cliff. There, at the foot of the cliff, the young lovers are joined again. Though clinically dead, they do not surrender to death. Not just yet. They find fierce strength in their love. They drag their broken bodies together. Then, locked in final embrace, they die. This is how Wahoo finds them. Too late, a flash of understanding comes over him. Too late, he is aware of the greatness of love. Too late, the lost opportunity for a lasting peace with the Chickasaws. Wahoo is now overcome with remorse. He has the two bodies, still locked in death, laid to rest on the banks of the Chattahoochee River, there to remain for eternity in a burial mound that still stands at the junction of Georgia Highway 17 and Georgia Highway 75. So that the lesson to be learned from this tragedy may never be forgotten, he renames the two valleys where first the young lovers met, one for Sati and the other Nakuchi. 
And so is the tale of how the region came to be known as Sati Nakuchi. But none of this is true. In front of the mound stands a historical marker that reads Nakuchi Indian Mound was the center of the ancient Cherokee town of Goxul, visited by De Soto in 1540 in his search for gold, according to legend. On this ceremonial mound, 190 feet long, 150 feet wide, and 20 feet high stood the townhouse where a sacred fire burned unceasingly. Ceremonial dances were performed in and around the townhouse. Residents of the town lived on the flat land surrounding the mound. The findings of Hay Foundation archaeologists explored the mound in 1915 indicate the advanced cultural development of the builders. So this is a historical marker, which means it has to be true, right? Unfortunately not. You see, the romantic story of Sati and Nakuchi is just a myth. And this quote-unquote historical sign is even more evidence to that. In 2004, the University of Georgia archaeological team confirmed there is no evidence of any Cherokee occupation in this area or the surrounding area for that matter during the time the mound was constructed. And DeSoto never came through this area. Excavations have shown that the burial ground was for the entire community of Native Americans rather than made specifically for two lovers. I believe it said there were around 75 remains found. In the 1800s, Captain James H. Nichols bought the property and cut a portion of the mound off and planted the gazebo atop. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt and assume he didn't realize it was a sacred burial ground. The first excavation of the mound did not begin until 1915, and Nichols sold the property in 1893 to Calvin Honeycutt, who later sold it to Lamartine Griffin Hardman. Hardman served two terms as governor, and his family donated what is now known as Hardman Farm and much of the surrounding land known as Smithgall Woods to the state of Georgia so that it could be protected. While we might raise an eyebrow at Captain Nichols for removing some of the mound to put a gazebo on top, many experts say that having the gazebo there probably inadvertently protected it from being leveled down. One of the legends I heard was that the two star-crossed lovers, their ghosts, are seen caressing each other in the gazebo. But if there never were actually two star-crossed lovers, which ghosts are hanging out in the gazebo. (laughs) I quickly dismissed that one because, well, the story is a myth and the Cherokee never even lived in these parts. All relics found surrounding the mound and in nearby locations are reminiscent of the ancestors of the Creek Indians. A few side tidbits to note. Nakuchi is the anglicization of the word nakos, which is creek for bear, and chattahoochee is the anglicized word for chattahachi, which was an itzamaya word. Chattahachi meant marked stone small river. Mount Yona was labeled as Mount Nakosi on Georgia's state maps up until 1833. Iberian gold miners would refer to this mountain as Monte Yona, Y-E-O-N-A, versus the Y-O-N-A-H that is spelled today. And Monte Yona means cougar mountain. Many people mistakenly believe that Yona means bear, but it is actually the name Nikosi or Nikuchi now that is closer to bear. So back to the mound. George Hayes was the man who looked over the original excavation that was mentioned earlier. This took place in 1915. And unfortunately, much of the misinformation surrounding the area is due to him. Without finding any Cherokee artifacts, he states that there is no question that the mound is Cherokee. He also makes an assumption that the area was visited by DeSoto but he had no archaeological evidence to back this up. 
he misquoted a man named Holmes saying that the Cherokee created the pottery in this area when in reality Holmes said the Creek were the ones who made the specific pottery being discussed. The North Georgia mountains were home of the Yuchi, Chickasaw, Appalachie, Itsiti, Kusa, and Kansa, and there were very few Cherokee until after 1785. You have to wonder, did he make an honest mistake, or was he purposely trying to change history here? Interestingly, there are books on the Appalachia history, how Appalachia got its name, and these are so easy to find in Europe, but you won't find any of this accurate information in the States, let alone Georgia. And if you do find it, it is very well hidden. All European maps up to 1693 show the capital of the Appalachia area being in the Nacoochee Valley, but in 1955, Georgia erected the marker that said it was the Cherokee. So going back to George Hayes, in one of his photographs, he has a Mesoamerican style artifact that was looked over. And there is evidence that shows some sort of connection between the ancients of central Mexico and the Cuchi Valley residents. And from there, the mystery continues. Many people of authority in Georgia have made an extensive effort to prove that Mesoamerican immigrants never traveled to Georgia. Funnily enough, one of the glyphs that was used as evidence was a Maya glyph, which was found at Track Rock Gap. I'm not really sure what happened over the centuries. Perhaps much of the legends of the Salty Nakuchi Valley were lost in translation. I find it odd that there is a clearly inaccurate historical marker. I originally started my search on this area trying to find out ghost stories in the sort, but landed upon a bigger mystery that I question if it will ever be solved. There's no doubt about it. When standing across the mound and across from the Hardman farm, there is something magical you can feel. Perhaps the air is just dense with the history of the many tribes and slaves who lived here. While I gazed at the gazebo, I imagined the ghosts of the natives walking through the field at night where their village once stood. I imagined them chuckling at the silly tourists who came to snap pictures of the mound believing the legend of the love story. Were they chuckling at me, I wondered. I got in the truck and drove further up the road past the hill where one of the legendary and controversial dare stones was found. In my research, I had read a couple of ghost stories and wanted to view the locations for myself. One of these locations is the Stovall Mill Covered Bridge and the other is the Stovall Inn House. Funny thing about bridges, I hear a lot of ghost stories surrounding them, especially covered bridges. I've often viewed certain bridges as liminal locales. One in particular is ingrained in my mind, and that is the green bridge I photographed in Wallala, California. I stood on one side of the bridge and peered across, and on the other side, you could only see darkness. But it wasn't just darkness. It was a darkness that you could feel. I could feel something pulling me towards it a numinous experience that only those who have felt can relate to. I arrived at the bridge just as a bit of rain began to trickle down. The covered bridge was smaller than I anticipated, and according to three different sources, the bridge is three different lengths, 33 feet, 36.87 feet, and 37 feet. The bridge crosses over the Chickamauga Creek, a few picnic tables are on the edge of each side of the creek, making a perfect spot to eat lunch next to the relaxing sounds of the bubbling creek. A man by the name of Fred Dover owned the land here. He built a mill complex, and the bridge was an important crossing between the Clayton and Cleveland roads. The road has since moved, and the original bridge washed away in the early 1890s. 
in 1895, Will Perdue replaced the bridge with a new covered bridge, and later, in 1917, a man by the name of Fred Stovall bought the complex. Locals say, don't cross the bridge unless you are ready to face what's on the other side. Don't cross the bridge unless you're ready to hear whatever is calling out after dark. Don't cross the bridge or you might hear a horse-drawn carriage. Don't cross the bridge for fear you might hear a baby crying. I walked around the bridge for a few minutes, took some photos, listened to the creek. I imagined what it used to look like before the road moved. If you've ever seen the movie, I'd Climb the Highest Mountain with Susan Hayward, you'll catch a glimpse of the covered bridge and the old road. The interior of the bridge is unfortunately covered in graffiti. I noticed some people had left little trinkets for those who have passed. I didn't hear any horse-drawn carriages or any babies crying, but I could feel the weight of time. In 70 years, this bridge and the surrounding area looks so different. What will it look like in another 70 years? I left the bridge deep in thought about the intricacies of time itself. A few minutes down the road is the Stovall House. According to the book Haunted North Georgia, Hamilton Schwartz and his wife Kathy purchased the 172-year-old Victorian house named for the family who lived there from 1893 until the 1940s. They acquired the home in 1982 and two years later, it was on the historic register. While working to restore the house, locals would stop by to warn the couple of the haunting's experience not just in the house, but on the land too. Moses Harshaw was the original owner and he was reportedly the meanest man who ever lived. Somewhere on the grounds his teenage daughter is buried and some have heard her crying out in the night for her mother. Harshaw settled in Nakuchi Valley in the 1820s. He was a businessman and lawyer. He represented himself in court and was found guilty on six of seven charges of assault and battery in the Superior Court of Habersham. This was from 1829 to 1844. He also was accused of attempted murder, but this trial never made it to court. He was cruel to everyone, but especially his slaves so much so that he would force the sick and elderly off the peak of Lynch Mountain. When he went into town, he always took a helper, but he never allowed slaves to ride in the wagon. He would attach a rope from the back of the wagon to the slave's neck and force him to run to keep up with the wagon. A slave girl had passed and his wife, Nancy, purchased a dress for the girl to be buried in. When he found out, he was so enraged, he insisted the grave be dug up and the dress removed from the body and returned for a refund. His wife, Nancy England Harshaw, was one of the first in 1850 when Georgia legalized divorce to stand up for herself. When Harshaw died, Nancy England requested his grave marker be carved with the words, died and gone to hell. The original marker is no longer around as it has probably rotted away, but a replica stands in its place today and is a short drive from the Stovall house if you want to stop by and say good riddance. Because Harshaw treated so many so horribly and we cannot be sure how many died at his hands, it is said the grounds he owned are filled with spirits seeking their vengeance or looking for peace. Other guests who have stayed at the inn have seen rattling doorknobs, heard phantom footsteps, and the occasional disembodied voice. When Schwartz and some carpenters were working late one night on renovations, he said they heard, Mama! Mama! He said he could hear the girl's voice plainly and repeatedly, so they went to investigate, but never found anyone. And he has never heard anything like that since. 
He has heard footsteps going down the stairs. But not all of the spirits of the Stovall house are scary. One of the cooks said she could feel a spirit when it entered the room. She said, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's a good spirit. You can feel it. Sati Nakuchi is an area rich in history, and there is definitely something mystical about the mountains here. Much like the winding trails of the Appalachian Mountains, I started my search down one path which led me to many other hidden ones I didn't even know existed. I feel like after digging through all of this history, I am left with even more questions than I began with. One of the biggest being, why is the history of North Georgia, and likely many other parts of Georgia, filled with so much disinformation, despite factual resources readily available in other parts of the world? The rain started coming in a bit heavier, and so I drove past the Stovall house, past the general store, turned back on to the Unicoi Turnpike, past the Indian Mound, and headed back home. Until next time, stay curious. <laughs>